the Arizona Cardinals must sit Marvin Harrison Jr. for the entirety of the preseason. Let's discuss. You are Locked On Cardinals, your daily Arizona Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked On Cardinals, Alex Clancy here. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner. Follow the podcast at Locked On AZ Cards. Thank you for making Locked On Cardinals your first listen. Free wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. At Clancy's Corner underscore. I'm still not used to this. I'm still trying to get my old Twitter account back. Bear with me. Um, yeah, with that, please go to the YouTube channel, search Locked On Arizona Cardinals, hit that subscribe button, man, turn notifications on, leave a comment. Comments have been starting to ramp up. I know it's, you know, if you think something, say it, agree with me, disagree with me. Let's have a conversation. I love interacting with everybody. Like it's, it's one of the best parts of this job. You know, it's you, the everydayers. Uh, thanks for making Locked On Cardinals again. Your first listen today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sportsing like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So, pack show today. Um, should the Cardinals go full Sean McVay mode? I'll explain what I mean in the third segment. Joint practice with Indy. How's it going? Um, a guest will be joining me in the final two segments, um, kind of against my will, uh, one of my dear friends and, um, a lot of you will know Bob Rock's joining me uh, for the final two segments, but uh, I wanted to start this show with something that I ended yesterday's show with, with what's been coming out of the joint practices with the Indianapolis Colts. Marvin Harrison Jr. Looks ready to go. He caught all four of his targets yesterday from Kyler Murray. Uh, had a couple really nice moves, really nice route run, routes run, and I think that's it. I don't think you need to see Marvin Harrison Jr. play a preseason game, and I've gone the opposite from what I've thought pretty much for my, my entire life in sports media. You got to play. You got to play. You got to play. You got to play. You got to see if it works. You got to see. And listen, for people who are trying to make rosters, yep, sure, it means something. Join practices are much more telling than games. The only real, aside from, you know, guys trying to make rosters, which are as equally as important. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm equal opportunity when it comes to talent level in the NFL and making rosters, whether it's first stringers or, or guys that are trying to make the practice squad so they can earn money playing in the NFL. It's important for them. Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be the wide receiver one for the Arizona Cardinals. They've had plenty of reps and – all you see in the preseason is every time somebody there's a tackle, it's like, all right, get up. Don't get her. Don't get her. Don't get her. Um, and the one bona fide way the Marvin Harrison Jr. will not get injured during the preseason games is if he doesn't play. Sure. NFL nature of the beast. We saw Minnesota lose JJ McCarthy and Jordan Addison's ankle injury is, is less serious than it seemed yesterday. Uh, we didn't know it right when I was recording it. That news dropped. So I was like, well, you know, no idea what's happening. But if you lose them, that's bad. And again, it was in practice. Okay. So I know things can happen at any point. It's part of the game. It's part of football. It could be any play. And with how fragile the Cardinals are, and I, I will use that term continuously, probably through the middle of the season until we really know what the hell all this is. Because there are so many questions. We have no idea about so many things. But in a positive way, in a positive way. And that's something that is going to be incredibly exciting. Okay. The day where I don't have to call this organization fragile anymore, because yes, Jason at frozen underscore smoke on Twitter, you'll get your shout out. Steve Kimes, the reason why the Cardinals are here. He's still a part of the story. He's why the fragility is still is present. Until that's not the case, it needs to be discussed. I don't want to. It's reason, not excuse. It was an excuse while he was here. It's a reason since he's been gone. My favorite thing to coin, and I, listen, I say smart things. I tell you, my quote is one a month. One smart thing to say. Steve Kime is the friend that would come over when you were growing up, play with all your toys with you, and then leave without helping clean them up. That's what he did to the Arizona Cardinals organization. Now, he was removed before he could clean up said toys. 
but that's why the Cardinals are where they are. So it's still a part of the story with Marvin Harrison Jr. and the fragility of this team. Even though, as I mentioned yesterday, this Car- this Cardinals offense is going to be good without Marvin Harrison Jr. If they didn't draft him, if he was taken at number three, or if a team traded up and went number one over, like whatever it was, and they didn't end up getting him, this offense was going to be a lot better than the last couple years anyways. Healthy Kyler Murray, James Conner, Trey McBride, Michael Wilson, Greg Dortz, like this is going to be a low-end top 20 offense without Marvin Harrison Jr., okay? But the fact that they have him, obviously, much better. With that, fragility plus needing Marvin Harrison Jr. to be healthy for the season so the Cardinals can go, 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 equals sit him during the preseason and snaps that don't matter. Joint practices are so much more telling than preseason games. They're fabricated money makers for the NFL and catered to, and rightfully so, players who are trying to move their way up the depth chart or just make the practice squad. New players, different teams, getting acclimated. The Cardinals have had so much time to get acclimated and the first four weeks of the season is the real preseason anyways for these teams. It's a lot of rust. It's a lot of losses by teams you expect to win and vice versa. Keep Marvin Harrison Jr. healthy. Have him stand on the sidelines for the next two weeks. Have him listen into the play calls. Have him talk with Kyler Murray. And cheer on your teammates. Joint practices with the Colts and the, and the, and the, uh, the Broncos. That's enough. He's going to get plenty of run. That's enough. He's a rookie. He's not going to be the number one option coming into the season. And that's the best thing. The best thing. This offense is not predicated solely upon Marvin Harrison Jr.'s production. This is going to be a run first team. This is going to be a Trey McBride team. Trey McBride could be all pro this year. And if Marvin Harrison Jr. becomes that adapted, to the NFL game that quickly, and he takes over that first option role in the pass game, everybody wins. But if not, they have the infrastructure in place to be able to manufacture a good offense without it. While he learns the NFL game and NFL speed once he does hit the once he does hit, you know, in between the lines in week one and beyond. If Kyler Murray's not playing, Marvin Harrison Jr. playing makes zero sense. Catching passes from Clayton Toon is a nightmare scenario for the Cardinals. That means Kyler Murray would have got hurt. It's unnecessary. Absolutely unnecessary. Sit Marvin Harrison Jr. and pinpoint week one as the first time he wears an Arizona Cardinals uniform in a meaningful game. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. Bo Brock, PHNX uh, Cardinals, PHNX Sports joins me next. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by our friends over at BetterHelp. Now, for somebody that's been to therapy throughout my life on and off, I understand the value of it. And a lot of things that come up is, you know, what are your self-care non-negotiables? Like, what are things that make your life better that you need to find time for? You know, maybe you never skip leg day or, or, or therapy day for that matter. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, and more, it's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when you know and we know what makes us happy, it's hard to make time for it. But when you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do, fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day. With BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H E L P.com slash locked on. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner underscore. Follow the podcast at Locked on AZ Cards. Um, thanks for hanging out. Uh, we're getting closer than ever, a couple weeks away. Um, and um, I was actually uh, required to do this, bring on my next guest. Um, and listen, I'm sorry ahead of time. It's uh, it's tough to look at, but um, you know we'll make do. Uh, Bo Brock, PHNX Cardinals, PHNX Sports, joining me at Bo Brock on Twitter. Former co-host uh, when the podcast wasn't as good of Locked On Cardinals. Uh, out <laughs> outside of Indy, um, you know, covering the joint practices ahead of the preseason game against the Colts. Bo, I wish I could say thanks for joining me. Oh my God! Why do I why do I do you any favors with well? Listen, it just makes introductions like that. What are you drinking no. out of there? 
I'm drinking coffee. It's it's it was that Kermit the Frog kind of thing that I was trying to go for, and just didn't. <laughs> it felt miserably. So I discussed. Uh, no, they do a great job over there. Him and, and Johnny Venerable. Um, always love you know connecting and and chatting cards. So um, Marvin Harrison Jr. has looked good every time he's been on a field where cameras have been rolling. I'm and I discussed in the last segment. I don't think that there's any reason why Clayton Toon or Desmond Ritter need to be throwing Marvin Harrison Jr. the ball during the preseason. It's not even just for injury concerns, anything like that. I just think it's absolutely – there's no con- constructive situation that would make it better for him to get reps throwing the ball you know, by Clayton Toon and Desmond Ritter. I just say week one should be his first time garnering an Arizona Cardinals uniform. Agree or disagree? Um, I agree to an extent, right? Because you look around the league and you see just uh, key player after key player go down to injury. I mean, what happened in Minnesota, it's brutal with J.J. McCarthy. And I think they dodged a bullet with Jordan Addison. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's value in it. Like, as silly as it is, three snaps in the preseason opener, just getting and kind of going through his process, you know, getting ready, going to the stadium, going through his pregame warm-ups, putting on the uniform, taking the field, and then seeing football action for the first time since November 25th against Michigan. That's that's how long of a layoff it was. Like mm-hmm. For them to ease Marvin Harrison Jr. back onto the playing field and in, in football shape, not to say that he's like brutally out of shape, I, I think it just gives him a little bit of – a feel of what it's going to look like come, you know, early September in Orchard Park against the Bills. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. And it's, it's not like injuries are part of the game. That's just what football is. It's, it's, it's playing right. minesweeper, you know, pretty much every week, every down, every play is what it is. Um, I was never good at minesweeper. It was, no, I was always a solitary. Neither. The three draw solitary. <laughs> we become borderline suicide. Anyways, um, w- when it comes to this, specifically who's shocked who's shocked by the way that clancy is good at a game that he played by himself i can just see you in in your room all alone kids playing outside and you just just working away at some solitaire oh i didn't even know if i had a key to my place everything was locked (laughs) stay the hell outside hydrate yourself from a hose and you know come back before it's dark come on dude this is not that right where you raised in like brooklyn joke over there i mean that what a terrible (laughs) terrible i mean of course my camera goes out as we do this um right yeah so listen when this podcast is better, in my opinion. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well, no. Here, the looks are back. Um, so, <laughs> while I understand all of that, and while it, you know, it makes rational sense, my kind of reasoning for it outside of the injury thing, which you know could happen any time, is he's not going to be forced to be the first option in week one. So he can ease in like most players will, and you know, especially you know it. Uh, not counting veterans, like young players, the first month is the preseason anyways, you know, new players, maybe new quarterback, maybe new play call, you know, whatever it is. Like this is going to be James Conner, Trey McBride a lot. So it's like, he's not forced Mm -hmm. to be that guy right away. So I think it, it, it broadens the spectrum for his, him necessarily needing to play in the preseason. Does that make sense? Like he he doesn't have to do it right away. No, and look, I mean, he's he's a unique prospect. I think that that's been established uh, throughout, you know, the draft process and in his final year at, at Ohio State. Like you see that this guy, fr- through what he put on tape, he provided himself kind of this ability to opt out, right? And and maybe the preseason becomes the next thing, you know, even though he played three snaps, and maybe he might, maybe he won't. We haven't gotten word of that. Jonathan Gannon said that the next, you know, the practices will kind of determine that and dictate that. But like, I think that there's value, like at at a new game speed for him, um, for him to go out there, and even if it's Desmond Ritter, Clayton Toon, whoever gets the nod to start with the ones on Saturday night, you know, feel what it's like to find the soft spot in coverage to what he's going to get over, even if he's not getting the ball. And if it's like, if his uptick goes from like three to six snaps, like I, I, you can find value in that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, there doesn't have to be a heavy amount of snaps for him to, for people to say, be comfortable with like, Oh, is he going to be ready? Come, you know, game one. I, I think that people should already have that confidence from what we saw, you know, with him and Kyler Murray and the ones playing against the Colts ones on Wednesday night. Like he, he was able to find some soft spots. He was able to do some similar things that he was doing at Ohio state already at the next level. What else are you seeing from um, the joint practices, like a positive and a negative? Is there, well, let's start with the negative. Is, is there anybody that's like, 
because you know when, when we did the show together and you know me ever since it's like all you want to not see is oh no that player isn't ready yeah for a young guy especially one with with higher draft capital like is there anybody there where it's like that may be more of a project than expected the the pass rush remains, you know, and, and that's that's a big that's been a consistent talking point, I think, for anybody who, who covers this team. Uh the defensive front, I think like obviously the interior of the defensive line is improved, but are they gonna get be able to generate enough pass rush off the edge to to really get this defense off the field? Um and then I think offensively, like as as much as we saw Kyler Murray link up with his playmakers consistently and make play, big plays down the field. The offensive line struggled against a very stout defensive front from the Indianapolis Colts. Like, I mean, it's DeForest Buckner, it's Quiddy Pay, it's first round pick, you know, Leatu Latu, mm-hmm. and they were a menace yesterday. And, you know, that that's concerning, right? I mean, as much as we we liked what we saw from the offensive line group last season, as far as joint practice number one, I think in pass pro, you can you can say that they struggled. Struggled in a sense that Kyler Murray is going to be running for his life or struggled in a sense that Kyler Murray is going to need to be, I call him the gray area plays now where he's going to need yeah. to Tony Romo, you know, hook out of, uh, of the pocket and, and kind of be, you know, throw past everything on the run. Like is, is, are we looking more like that at, at the ladder from, think, from that first, first practice? I think that when, when you see like defensive fronts that uh, have the personnel, it, it it could be concerning. Like I, the three guys I rattle off, like they're they're really good, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, week one against Buffalo, and it's like Ed Oliver and, and maybe Gregory Rousseau. It's like I think they can hang with with teams like that. They should be able to. And like week two against LA, like a, a game by game basis. But and then you you also have to factor in like how they're going to run the football because this offensive line is geared to run the football, mm-hmm. and that's where they excel. And that could take some of the pressure off. And pass pro, so yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to be some, it's not going to look like you know the pass what you were kind of uh, outlining there, like where it's just like snap the ball and it's a jailbreak, and Kyler Murray has to immediately make a play just to make a play. Yeah, yeah. Bob Rock, PHNX Cardinals, joining me here. You see, you sound how excited I am. Um, so like, <laughs> that wasn't my best delivery. Yeah, you know, I got I got work to do. No, um, yeah, positives. Like from the wide receiver room, we've seen flashes. Greg Dorch, Michael Wilson, um, Zay Jones catches everything. He's a great route runner. Like, do you see this being a four deep wide receiver group, or is there one that? Because I mean, it's Greg Dorch can't catch a break with the amount of opportunity that everybody's been pining for. I just feel like this is mm-hmm. a perfect time for that. Like, are we going to see all of them on the field a lot? No, I mean you're going to see. 11 personnel probably 60 percent of the time right and that's going to feature the 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 big three i guess we'll call them right for lack of a a better nickname but like wilson mhj and dorch and then you know zay jones is is so versatile jg calls him a three position wide receiver he can fill in anywhere and then i think chris moore plays a role on this team as as your deep threat i think he's a guy that can take the top off the defense we saw it against the colts defense in joint practice yesterday a big play down the sideline and then it's just going to be a dogfight, I think, for four players for the, the other two probably spots that you would project to carry six wide receivers between, like, Pascal, who I think has the edge, what he brings locker room-wise, special teams-wise, what he's, he does in the run game as a wide receiver. And then, you know, like Dan Chisnia, who's plays teams as well, is, is stood out with this, you know, second and third teams with Toon. Um, you know, Xavier Weaver and, and T-Palms, Tejon Palmer. Yeah, Xavier Weaver would be a very interesting. For those who don't remember, he was the second wide receiver in Colorado last year. And then when Travis Hunter got hurt, he was kind of thrust into that role and had some had some real flash plays. So I know people have been asking me in the comments on YouTube about him. It's just it's gonna be fascinating to see if there's a spot, you know, if he's a if he's a practice squad guy. I think he has the makings of a, of a you know an NFL wide receiver. It's just gonna be interesting to see with how deep the Cardinals yeah. wide receiver room is. And remember. This wide receiver room was one of the worst in football last year. So when you're talking about how things can switch quickly, bear with the defense because that's what what I say is last year's offense is this year's defense, where it's like they're a year away, you need to see proof of concept, and then you infuse with talent. Now with that, with all the question marks, especially on the defensive side of the ball, I'm going to ask Bo Brock the question, do the Cardinals go full Sean McVay mode and just sit all the starters for the entirety of the preseason with how fragile the state is right now, how the guys who the Cardinals need to produce come week one, if any of those guys were to get injured, 
everything changes even more for the worse. We'll discuss it next. Locked on Cardinals. Your team every day. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. I love sports. Um, I love them a lot. Um, I even like the Justin Timberlake opening song at the ESPYs when he hosted it 10 years ago called I Love Sports. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like we want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus every day. That's right. There's something for everyone every day. All summer long. If you're a fo- if you're a baseball fan, this is your time to shine, man. This is your March Madness for the next couple months, and Fanduel's got you covered for all of it. So head over to Fanduel.com and start making the most out of your summer. Fanduel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, Alex Clancy, Locked On Cardinals. Follow me on Twitter, Clancy's Corner underscore. Follow the podcast at Locked On AZ Cards. Please go to the YouTube channel, search Locked On Arizona Cardinals, hit the subscribe button, man. Bo Brock, PHNX Cardinals joins me. One of the dynamic duo over there, he and Johnny Venerable do do great job. Um, with the state of the defense, when you're looking at these next two preseason games, mm-hmm. aside from the rookies with the cornerback room with a lot of questions, mm-hmm. you know, Elijah Jones didn't play very well. Max Mountain didn't play last week. Um, should Is Sean McVay mode? a real possibility for the starters, the bona fide starters for this team come 2024. And if those, for those that don't know, Sean McVay doesn't play guys in the preseason. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the guys who have a solidified role, the, the Buda Bakers, Jalen Thompson's, uh, Kazir White's of this team, I, I don't know if they have any reason to go out there. Uh, they have like locked in what they need to do with this, with this defensive scheme, with every single call that Nick Rollis and Jonathan Gannon are going to dial up. And, you know, it's also a key thing here that I think that the the second group of this team offensively and defensively, like it is, they, they want to see these guys play a lot to make some tough decisions because the infusion of talent and players on this roster is, is very real. Monty Ossetford has churned this thing in, you know, nine draft picks at 13 first year players last year and then had a 12 player, 15, 15 players in all first year players coming in this season like you're you're upwards close to 30 that you know you want to make a spot for and you want to see like okay where do they fit in what role do they play and I think that that's what they're really going to utilize the actual preseason games for and in, in determining that and where they the guys that they already know things about like they they don't need to see anything else from them because of you know what McVay does he, he doesn't want to put them in harm's way for something that they already kind of know to be true yeah you know, it'll be interesting. You know, it's with Darius Robinson last week playing whatever eleven snaps, and he got behind the line of scrimmage immediately. Uh, Xavier um, Xavier Thomas was a surprise. That first step, I think you and I yeah. both tweeted at the same time. Like that first step when he got around the left tackle was immediate after the after the ball was snapped. Like he he looks so fast. Do you think he's a guy that even though he's a late round pick and played six years at Clemson, and he got a couple red shirts for for medical reasons, like? Do you think he's a guy that could skyrocket up this very, very light pass rush room talent-wise? Yeah, yes, I do. I think that uh, he's got elite quickness. In, I, I steal that from Brian Baldinger, who watched his tape and obviously knows what to look for more so than you and I. But if, if he's a guy that his role is pin your ears back and get after the quarterback, I think that that brings value to this pass rush, and that separates him from – the do everything guys like Zayvon Collins, Dennis Gardeck, you know, and, and Victor Dumakage. It's like, hey, it's third down, and everybody knows that a pass is coming. All right, maybe XT can get in there and get after the passer just because of his his ability to come off off the snap and, and get after the quarterback. Yeah, I think he he's quickly carving out a role for himself, and probably would have done so even if BJ Ujolari had stayed healthy. Yeah. And then, oh, and then, you know what, let's, let's, let's do this. And I agree with you. I mean, it's, it'll just be fascinating to see. I think LJ Collier is going to have a role. Like I think LJ Collier, he had a very good camp last year uh, for those who don't Mm -hmm. remember, got injured early. Um, He came over from Seattle. He's sneaky young. I think he's 27. Like this is a guy that, that can make an impact. And I, you know, we're going to find out real quickly with, with um, Josh Allen and Matthew Stafford and Jared Goff, like immediately we'll find out how, how promising or how bad this pass rush is. Um, I saw you guys, you know what, I actually talked about it yesterday also. I'm in the camp Mm -hmm. that 
trading for Hassan Reddick would be a mistake. And it's not just because uh, the, the expensive, it's not like, oh, let's remarry this team. This is an organization in name only from where he came from and where he was drafted from. Yeah. It's a completely different organization. I would be more interested in them for trading for Hassan Reddick if BJ Ojolari was healthy. Like Hassan mm-hmm. Reddick won't move the needle enough, like using the baseball term, the, the win above replacement. Like they're not going to win three more games trading for Hassan Reddick because his defense isn't there yet. Do you agree or disagree? No, yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that that's, it would go against the grain of the philosophy of this organization. Like what, what they want to do, and you know this is they want to draft and develop and they want to build a consistently um, a consistent winner. And, you know, going out and getting a, a 29-year-old pass rusher whose production dropped off a little bit, still double-digit sacks from the previous season, but from 17 and a half to 11 and his, you know, Philly decided to move off of him. And then, you know, the Jets are having their own issues where he hasn't even reported. Like, those are red flags. And you're right. Like, as much as we liked Hassan Reddick, the Arizona Cardinal, and and what he was able to do and and turn his career around and and make a a name for himself in this league after how tumultuous things were to start in the Kime regime, you know, I, I just don't think that it fits. Like, you don't take a guy at 29, give up assets to trade for him, and then give him also, you know, what he's commanding as far as, uh, his contract, 26 to $30 million a season. That's not what good organizations do that want to be uh, consistently winning football games year in and year out. Yeah. It's just the only thing that, you know, I can't help but think is they got a lot of money to spend still on this year's cap, but they have upwards of yeah. 30 mil. Just like, what are you going to do with it? You're just going to roll it? Like they, they have 90 against the cap as of right now, or they have 90 in space to start next year. Roughly. It's like, what are you going to do with it? Like, are you punting yeah. on defense this year? Like you punted on everything last year and then you go out and spend, because at some point this plan by Monty, it, you're going to need to bring in talent too, not just through the draft. Like and they're going right. to have a lot of money. I'm sure they'll be very active. It's going to be a lot of defensive guys. I'm sure they'll sign a couple pass rushers, probably an off ball linebacker, probably a corner, depending on what happens with Buda Baker, maybe a, a free safety. Like this plan is going to change come next season. Sure, it will, but shift. at the same time, yeah, you just don't. But you like the, the market isn't right. Like what's what's going on? Like the the stalemate with the Jets in Hassan Reddick. Like you, you still you monitor it, right? And I think that if he becomes you know available for pennies on the dollar, and you have an understanding, you're actually a confident franchise with Monty Osipor calling the, the shots instead of Joe Douglas. Like what the plan is beyond this year, and, you, and like he they just can't figure it out in in Jersey. And you say, hey, Hassan, just come reunite with JG, play this out, and then go to free agency, and, and, but we'll, we'll set you up for success. Then, then that's a good – and JG signs off on it, then perfect. Yeah. But if it's like bring him over and just like Steve Kime used to do with all these hold-ins and stuff, like, hey, just you know, bend the knee and give them whatever they want. That's, that, those days are done with this organization. Yeah. And they'll, they'll, look, they'll, they'll monitor. Like they're – it, like if there's not a pass rusher, like nobody's gonna get rid of a pass rusher right now because they everybody feels like they can contend. But once like reality hits and the season begins and people start losing games, maybe somebody becomes available and that's how they fill the need. Yeah, for sure. And I, you're not gonna get 25 year old pass rushers on the market. 24 year old pass rushers off the right. deal. Premium if they're position. worth their weight, their team's gonna resign them at least for you right. know or franchise tag and whatever it is. Like if you tell me they gave him JJ Watt contract. The two-year $40 million, do a dummy year to make it less on the cap next year, and you want to sign off on that, you may be able to get behind that if he's here for more than one year. Like, But he could go full Jadavion Clowney mode, Akeem Tlaib, Darrell Rivas mode, and just go get 12 or 13 mil wherever he can, and that's not something you yeah. want the Cardinals to sign up for, for sure. Um, Bo Brock, doing good stuff over there at PHNX. Thanks for joining me, dude. I really appreciate it. Remember, without you, there is no me. I'll talk to you tomorrow.